Welcome back to Ali, Atrévete a lo Imposible, Season 2. Today we have Tim Gasparic. Mm -hmm. I have a special love and appreciation for teachers. I There isn't a teacher that I'd be like, oh my gosh, this is one person that I would go to. Uh, or that I have a beautiful memory associated with that was my teacher. I wouldn't say that I necessarily have that, but just... Waking up every day and, and having the impact and influence that teachers have on the younger generation, mm -hmm. I believe is extremely beautiful. So I feel as though I'm drawn to teachers quite a bit and having conversations about that because they are impacting the society that will form in the future. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is yeah. like something super, super beautiful about that. So I would like to say thank you for accepting to come on. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm very grateful. Um, it it's I'm excited for this episode. Once again, we've had several conversations before, but I really appreciate the energy that you share as a person. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a there's a positivity that that comes with any conversation that I feel as though we've had, and I think that that is amazing. And um, so I'm grateful to have you on. Who yeah. is Tim? Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for thanking teachers. Um, it, uh, it is kind of a, it can be a thankless profession sometimes. So I'm glad you are aware of that, that, yeah, it is. We're out there sculpt sculpting the next generation of America. Um, and that's not a responsibility I take lightly. Um, but yeah, so my name is Tim Gasper. I teach ESOL in that is English as a second or other language in Somerville, South Carolina. I'm at Somerville High School. Um, this is my second year teaching. Uh, I love it. I absolutely love it. It's, it's teaching for me has always been a passion. Um, I was lucky, lucky enough to know what I wanted to do at a young age. Uh, I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. So the Lord gifted me with the talents and the abilities to do that. Um, I guess a little bit more about me. I graduated from College of Charleston with a degree in Spanish and education with a minor in linguistics. Uh, I love, I love languages. I love, I love languages, culture, and linguistics. Those are like the, like the biggest things. I'd say those three things define me as a person. Um, and with teaching, I'm able to share that to my kids, with my kids, and I'm able to share that and communicate that with people. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit, that, that's what I do for a career, I guess, mm -hmm. but um, outside of that, I love, I love philosophy, I love reading, poetry, uh, I love soccer, football, um, yeah, I don't know, I, I, uh, uh, I guess that's, that kind of, kind of describes me. Why, why Spanish? Spanish. Okay, so uh, I think I can do this better the second time. But <laughs> um, growing up, uh, and okay, I've told you this many times. I've never had the ability to tell my full story about why I picked Spanish, so I'm glad you're giving me the opportunity to do that. Um, growing up, I was always interested by languages. Always, 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 always. There's always like that drive and urge whenever I heard a foreign language I'm like what are they saying that sounds so cool um so I was born in Cleveland Ohio don't hate me I'm from Ohio <laughs> um and I remember going to school my kindergarten class was so diverse um I mean you could hear Greek Haitian Creole Japanese Polish all these different languages were all spoken around me and I was like oh that's like I think as a kid I wasn't so conscious of it but it's something that definitely influenced me because my whole friend group were kids from different cultures like I had this friend uh, from from his family from Greece to go over his house and hear Greek and I had a friend from Haiti go over to his house here Haitian Creole um, so growing up I always had a love and appreciation for cultures and uh, I moved uh, when I was seven. I moved from Cleveland, Ohio to uh, Lexington, South Carolina. And I was put in a small private Christian school. Um, my parents 
afforded me the, the, the privilege of going to that school because it really was a privilege to go there. And um, I don't remember this, but, um, but my friend, he told me this story. Um, first day in first grade, little kid comes up to me and he's like, do you speak Spanish? I'm like, no. He's like, are you Mexican? I'm like, no. And he's like, do you want to be best friends? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so from that day on, um, my best friend growing up uh, was Mexican-American. So, um, like growing up, I was always over at his house, mm -hmm. always hanging out with him, playing soccer with him and his buddies, uh, going over to his house, hearing Spanish all of the time, like all the time. And like his father was a pastor, so whenever they had church events, like there was the uh, English-speaking church and the uh, Spanish-speaking church, and his father was the pastor of the Spanish-speaking church. So um, I'd go over to his house and there'd be like a little party or something, and then there'd be a bunch of people around me speaking Spanish and they don't speak English, and I'm like, okay, this is cool. Always, I was always around Latinos in the Spanish-speaking, in a Spanish-speaking environment. So that continued on for a long time. So I got to 10th grade. Um, so that same church, it was uh, Grace Baptist Church. There was Iglesia Bautista de La Gracia. And then there's Grace Christian School. Um, I went to Grace Christian School for 10 years. And in my 10th grade year, um, the pastor's wife, Miss Aguilar, love that woman, just like a second mom to me, um, she, she, she taught Spanish at the school. So 10th grade, I started learning Spanish. And I realized that I was like, oh, dang, like, I like this. Like, this is great. And it kind of begs the question, like, do you like what you're good at? Or are you good at what you like? That's hmm. something that I've thought about. Like, do I like this because I'm good at it? Or am I good at it because I like it? Because I've been around it my whole life. And so I took Spanish one with her and I aced it. I loved it. I ate that up. Like, I was, I was like, going home and um, doing the practice problems. I filled out the whole book before I even, like, finished it. I was reading it. I was, like, watching YouTube, listening to music, all that. Um, and then, like, on top of that, like, he was my best friend. So I would hang out with him. His mom would yell at us in class. And then we'd go home and make and play Xbox or whatever. And his mom would yell at us at, at the house. <laughs> and then I, I ended up going to that... Spanish church and then his dad would yell at us at the church uh, we were kind of we were kind of traviesos but that's whatever um, but yeah so Spanish um, I kind of realized that I had a talent for it mm -hmm. and I was able to pick it up a little bit quicker than some people um, and I kind of I, I, I ended up leaving that school going to public school and I, I kept pursuing Spanish I had some great teachers there too which was awesome which was vital for me um, and, my, and my growth as, a, as someone who's like learning Spanish. Um, but yeah, I, I stuck with it and I'm like, this is something, this is where uh, I could be useful kind of. Uh, I, originally I wanted to just be a Spanish teacher and then I was like, okay, I can be a Spanish teacher, I can teach other people Spanish and then I kind of realized that a lot of Americans don't really like speaking another language. So I'm like, I don't really want to do that. And so off of a whim, I, I signed up for this camp, an ESL camp. So it was junior year. So I was just like, it was summer. I don't know why. I don't, I can't to this day, I can't remember why I signed up for it, but it was an ESL camp. So these little kids, you could, these little Hispanic kids, um, we would meet from 8 to 12 in the morning and basically I just got to read to them and speak Spanish with them and play soccer with them and be a teacher and I was like, I love this. Mm. I love, love this because I can speak Spanish, I can speak English, I can, I know, like, I know how this works, this is so familiar to me. So I was like, that's what I need to do. That's, 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 that's my career now. Like, that's what I, that's where I'm most useful and that's where I'm needed. Um, so yeah, that, uh, I was very, very fortunate from a young age, like I was only 15 or 16 when that happened, to know that um, one, where I'm needed, where I'm most useful, and two, I enjoy it, like I have the talents, 
and I love doing it on and off, teaching and not teaching, I love doing it. Um, yeah, I was very, very, for, I've been very, very fortunate um, to, to be able to continue practicing and learning and learning Spanish. And then on top of that, I went to, went to university and studied Spanish in, at university, right? But I wasn't able, so uh, being in education as a male, you're afforded a lot more monetary opportunities because we need male teachers. So I was able to go to school, to CFC College of Charleston for basically free because I was given so many scholarships. One, for being a male, because there's barely any male teachers out there. Two, for being bilingual. Well, I can speak other languages now, but at the time I could have made it Spanish, but um, I was basically, people were just throwing money at me to go to school because we need, we need these, we need bilingual teachers so bad. We need Spanish teachers. We need ESL teachers so bad. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that, that's kind of my journey leading up to now. I graduated, got a, a job at, at uh, middle school and high school, and I liked it. And then I'm continuing at the high school right now, ESL. So I love it. Love it to death. Was there ever a moment because it's common and it happened? It's common. It's common, but it, it also happened to me throughout my college experience. But did you ever, did it ever cross your mind that maybe there was something else? Yes. I had this conversation with my friend not too long ago. We were, I make a joke out of it now. Whenever mm -hmm. my kids are being bad, I'm like, ah, I could have been an engineer. <laughs> I'm like, I could have been a doctor. Yeah, an I accountant. Could, I could have been an accountant, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, my dad and mom, well, my mom's always been supportive, but my dad was like, you're not going to make any money being a teacher. And mm -hmm. rightfully so, because there's no money in education. Mm -hmm. And he's right. Um, he's like, you should be a doctor. You should be a lawyer. You can make some money. And I'm like, ah, I couldn't do that. I just could not see myself doing anything else but being a teacher. Um, yeah, there's been times where I'm like, man, what if I went back and was, I really like math. Oddly enough, um, I love math. I love, I kind of do like working with numbers sometimes as much as I, as much as I rag on you, I mm -hmm. do kind of like, I do, I do kind of like it. All right. Mm. So that's a talent. That's a gift. Like being able to work with numbers and stuff. But I just don't think I would be fulfilled. I don't think I would be as fulfilled as I am right now because you don't get really get. You don't, okay, with teaching, you get to see the direct results of you helping people. I help mm. people, I'm on the front lines every day, and I'm helping people, and I see, sometimes I don't see the results. Sometimes you see the results way down the road. Mm. But I get to translate a document or help a kid with math in the moment, and I can, there it is. With, with being, with being um, working with numbers or stuff where you get paid a little bit more, you don't see those results. It's mm -hmm. a little bit more abstract. That's why you get paid for it, because it's in the abstract. Because some people can't, um, they can't understand as well the abstract, all that math, you know, logic, all that. Um, it's difficult, but you just don't really, it's like you're three steps removed from the people you're helping. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I would like that. Also, I'm just like, I'm, 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 I have so much energy all the time. If I'm sitting at a desk, I would probably like, I'm so fidgety. Like, mm -hmm. I would not be able to do that. I have to be like, run, like in my classroom, I'm like running circles all the time, just mm -hmm. bothering the heck out of my students. So I just don't think I could. It, it never really, I thought about it, but it never really, I never entertained it too much. Mm -hmm. I think having that ability to understand yourself in that way is refreshing nowadays. I was listening to this uh, podcast the other day and uh, an older guy was talking about this younger generation and how much exposure we have to so many things. Oh yes. Oh my so gosh. everything seems a possibility. That's where the anxiety comes in. Mm -hmm. yeah. everything, everything is a possibility so we struggle as individuals to choose what we want to pursue. Um, to a point where we don't pursue anything. Yeah. Um, I was listening, uh, it was Jordan Peterson. He was like, you, you, okay, the anxiety really comes in when you're, you're standing, 
you're, you're in the middle, and you could go any possible direction. You could、mm-hmm. go anywhere. There's so many options that you just stand still.、Mm. So, yeah, and it's funny because people in、um, it's funny people in communist China. I've seen I, I I've heard about this where they're like I kind of like it when the government tells me what to do because I don't have to figure it out. And then when you get that, they they're given those. Those economic and opportunities, they're able to make opportunities for themselves. They're like, actually, I don't like that. I kind of want to go back to someone telling me and having that straight and narrow path and just being able to walk down it.、Mm. But it is quite frightening to.、Um, that's why I say I was lucky because I always knew what I wanted to do.、Mm-hmm. But a lot of my friends have no idea what they want to do,、mm-hmm. and they're just going all over the place. So. Yeah, and that's where the anxiety comes comes in because you have infinite possibilities. So that means you have infinite ways directions you can go, and、uh, how do you know which way is the right way?、Mm-hmm. You don't.、Mm-hmm. I don't think you ever do.、Mm. But you have to justify and be like, okay, I chose this path. I chose this path to be a teacher, and and、uh, that's what I'm gonna stick with. And it's funny because you don't really realize it until you do some reflecting and look back and see how, like, wow, they 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 shaped me and become who who I am today. I could I okay, I'll give a short list because I have a lot.、Uh, Miss Aguilar, the woman who taught me Spanish. Like I have everything. To, I have so much to thank for her. Like, she is. I still use some of the.、Um, Uh, techniques that she used、mm-hmm. in her Spanish class with my kids,、um, Mr. Bushy.、Um, he was oh my god, Mr. Bushy was so sarcastic.、Um, so we okay, should we preface that we went to the same school、yes. for like one year? We、yes. went to the same school for one year, and you had the most. Uh, uh, he taught English or something. I I don't I think it was English, but he was so. Good at preparing. Every lesson that he had was four parts, and I don't know how to explain it, but he had this mocking tone, like he is so bitterly sarcastic that, as a middle schooler, I I would get it because my dad is sarcastic, but sometimes it would go over people's head, and、mm-hmm. I, I thought he was he is so funny,、mm-hmm. he is hilarious.、Um, I don't think I've ever had the chance to thank him, but I think I might do that,、uh, Mr. Bushy. Huge role model.、Um, trying to think. In college, I had two professors that are very near and dear to my heart. One,、um, Dr. Ricardo Vinas de Puig.、Um, he is who got me interested in linguistics. I I took him. I took six of his classes, six classes with him. So he was so tired of seeing me,、um, but. He is the one who got me inspired and interested in linguistics. He taught me、um, everything I know about linguistics.、Um, he got me interested in indigenous languages, which is a huge passion of mine. Taught me everything I know about linguistics. Love, love, love that man.、Um, and then Dr. Wires, Dr. Joseph Wires, who are both at、um, College of Charleston. He is more of a social linguistics, like the social aspect of linguistics, which I also love. Um, he's like a grandpa to me. I love that man too. So,、um, looking back at how I teach, I'm like Miss Aguilar because I use her techniques sometimes. I'm bitterly sarcastic. I'm so mean sometimes when it comes to the sarcasm.、Mm. Um, that's not the Mr. Bushy in me. Also, my dad in me.、Um, uh, Doctor Vinas de Puig,、um, huge linguist. I I try to bring linguistics into my. Classroom as much as possible, because、mm-hmm. a lot of people aren't aware of how important linguistics is. And same thing with、uh, Dr. Wires. Each one of them, and also my parents. Like、mm-hmm. I am, I am my father's son, and I am my mother's son.、Uh, I'm a talker like my mom, and I'm very analytic like my dad.、Um, the way that they taught me to read, to do math, and all that, I definitely imitate. So I'm kind of like a con- con- conglomeration of all these people. But I am my own person, so、mm-hmm. I bring my own. I also bring my own、um, uh, aspect or style of teaching.、Mm-hmm. But I definitely teachers are the best thieves. 
because we take some we see something we're like all right i'm using that i'm gonna do that all right mm. that's mine now and mm -hmm. then you take it and you make it your own mm -hmm. so teaching is a lot of thievery <laughs> it's a lot of stealing it's a lot of stealing mm. different things you like and using it mm -hmm. so i appreciate that i appreciate one that note of gonna reach out to someone and thank them because we are influenced by our experiences sure. and who we encounter yeah um, I would say a lot of this project is based on, shout out to Antonio Andrews with No Parking Studios. Um, I think a lot of this is is taken from him and how much he loves his community and what he does for his community and how he communicates that through his art. He's an artist. He's also a rapper. I would like to say he's a community leader, but he is an amazing person. So to make that note of Hey, I'm gonna go out and thank these people for the influence that they've mm -hmm. had in my life is is so big and I don't think it's something we do often enough. I don't do often yeah. enough, I'm not sure if you do, but to be able to say thank you to someone and also how you influence people's lives, I think is often overlooked mm -hmm. in a, an encounter that you may have with a student that's oh, five yeah. minutes could change your life. Oh, every okay. Everybody is a leader. Everybody has someone that looks that that looks up to you. Um my position, yeah, obviously I, I lead these kids, but even the older kids in my classroom, the younger kids look up to them. And those younger kids, their younger siblings look up to them. Mm. Everybody is a leader. Everybody is an influencer. I hate that word, but mm. you know what I, you know what I mean? Like um everybody has the opportunity to be a leader and to do what's like to to show um I don't know what you're about or what what you can do or what you're good at um and you always have people watching you mm -hmm. it doesn't matter who you are you always 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 have people watching you mm. so um yeah that, that that is something that's really big yeah so why esol um so like i said i i went to that i went to that camp i loved it it was awesome um loved it saw my i saw where i was useful pretty much I saw that um, used to well, especially in the United States, is a lot of being culturally aware. A lot of Americans aren't very culturally aware. So I grew up always surrounded by different cultures and appreciating and loving different cultures. And so being an ESOL teacher, subject knowledge is important, but cultural awareness, I would say, is way more important. Mm. Um, so I, I think I'm very culturally intelligent and that that's a job where that's very useful. Uh, I also speak, I speak Spanish, I speak Portuguese and French as well. So being able to use all those languages, be a teacher, be culturally aware, the ESL is the only job where you can really do that. Um, ESL, being an ESL teacher, you are using all of those skills daily going from English to Spanish, knowing, knowing how to explain a cultural um, quirk or something, something that you find in one culture to another person, or knowing that, um, hey, if a kid whistles at you, they're just trying to get your attention, or if they go, Ch -ch -ch, like, it's not disrespectful, it's just how they do that in their culture, like, don't be mad, or, mm -hmm. you know, or like, um, knowing that, um, like, uh, well, okay, here's another thing, is knowing that the Mexican experience is different from the Mexican-American experience, is different from the American experience. Mm. That is something that I had the privilege of being surrounded by Mexican-Americans, so I know, I mean, I know how the Mexican experience is, I know how the American experience is, but not a lot of people know that there's, there's a very, very specific niche and that is the Mexican American experience, the Guatemalan American experience. The second or third, or the, I guess the first or second or third, like the second generation of kids where your parents are immigrants and you or you are the ones that have to speak English and Spanish. You have to translate documents. You have to, you have to basically be the parent. Mm. In some, in some real regard, you have to be a parent. You have to translate documents for your parents. You have to know, like, where to take a lot of times I see it um in in my high school 
you have to fill out all these forms for the school that you have no idea what they mean. Like, mm-hmm. what the heck is a shared housing form? Why do, why do my parents have to sign it? And why do I have to translate that for them? Mm. Um, I don't think that responsibility should be on the kids. So me as an ESOL teacher, I'm taking that responsibility from them and I'm able to communicate and I'm able to translate and be help the communi- community and navigate all three different worlds, like the, the immigrant experience, the first gen, the second gen, and third gen, and everything, and integrate that into the American school system, mm. I guess. And that's kind of the only place you get to do that. It's really special being an ESOL teacher um, because you're surrounded by cultures all the time. And um, yeah, it, it's just something that's very special. What's really interesting, and we, we spoke about this, I was having a conversation, we were having a conversation, uh, let's see, myself and my cousin Victoria were talking about translating documents for your yeah. parents. <laughs> And uh, Victoria oh gosh, brought yeah. up this specific scenario, <laughs> um, but she said, <laughs> she said that uh, she was talking about translating documents for your parents, and that her mom would be like, and you're like five. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Oh, oh my god. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's interesting, right? And and. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I will say that being the daughter of two Guatemalan immigrants that came to the United States, there's a lot of a lot of challenge that comes with it. I, I believe that I personally had the privilege of having two older brothers that were going to school already and that were learning English and were helping my parents with English. So I would say maybe Antonio went through more of that translating sure. documents. The older, you are the second, you basically are the second parent. You're, mm-hmm. the, you're the gateway if you're the oldest. Older, yes. Older brother, older sister. Yes. Yes. I've seen it. Okay. I've seen kids as young as 10 years old having to, or like 10, like young kids, 10, 11, 12, having to translate for their parents. Mm. Like we, we had a, um, a, um, I don't even remember what it was. It was a admissions day or something for my school and for the high school. And I was there translating and this kid came in nine years old. 10 years old, something like that, third grade. And his mom didn't speak English and he had to fill out a form on the laptop for his mother. It, like legal things, like how many people do you live with? What is your income? All that stuff. Mm-hmm. He had to translate that and tell it to his mom. Mm-hmm. And I saw, I've seen that so many times. I've seen, and it's always the, there was another time I was at a middle school and there was this older daughter. She was like 12 years old. Um, that family was Portuguese speaking. Um, I'm pretty sure they're from Brazil. Um, she had to translate, and I'm mm-hmm. like, no, this isn't your job. This is my job. You can, you're fine. Like, like, I'm. We're not doing a good job of translating these documents for you guys, for your families. You shouldn't take that responsibility. Mm. Sadly, it is the reality. Like, you, you can't translate every single document. But you should offer some sort of help, mm-hmm. at least. You, or maybe it'll take time before we do translate every single document. But it should not be on the kids to do that. That is not their job. Mm. They need their job is to be a kid and to like, not to be a parent. Mm. Yeah, it's tough. It, that that breaks my heart. I hate seeing that. Yeah, it's, it's a character. Uh, building for sure. Uh, type of exercise. Uh growing up with parents, I don't even say even even nowadays there are certain things and certain topics and my parents are like, hey, can you tap into this or can you help with this? I don't understand this. Yeah. And, and some of it is complex, right? Yeah. It's also something to note. But yeah, to be that young and to have that responsibility is 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 interesting. And you hear funny stories sometimes because uh, like you take you take a six year old to the doctor with you and you're trying to tell the doctor like what's wrong with you. <laughs> yeah. And the kids translating and then I've heard stories where like the kids will lie and say something else. Yeah. And- oh no. My kids what they do, like uh, like they just they won't tell their parents their grades. Mm. So they get the like their parents, um, they don't know how to work, like the technology you can't read it or anything. Mm-hmm. So they can just like Oh yeah, mom, well, I got all these and bees. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Yeah. So it's, it, I mean, that's not a good thing. I mean, they shouldn't do that. But 
They can play Xbox on the weekends, even though they fail in all their classes. Yeah, you know? yeah. But yeah, no, they, yeah. Would you say, and I'm, I'm curious to, to learn, to understand this, but would you say that sometimes the engagement that students have with different subjects and different material isn't due to the fact, like their lack of engagement, isn't due to the fact that they don't understand the information or don't care for it, but could be due to the fact of how they are taught it? Mm, oh, absolutely. Okay. Here's, yeah, for sure. Um, I took chemistry in high school. The teacher was fantastic. No, I'm sorry. I took physics in high school. The teacher was fantastic. He was amazing. And then I took it again in college, and I did not understand a single word the man was saying. Mm. Same course. I mean, obviously, with different levels uh, of, like, difficulty but a lot of teaching is communicating an idea and so if you're a bad communicator like you're not a good teacher you have to be able to present that information a lot of my job is like making it fun and being able to like play with it or being able to make it interesting you know because why would you want to do something that's boring? Like, mm -hmm. um, why would you show up to... My, my classes are an hour and 30 minutes, right? Why would you show up to an hour and 30 minute meeting if it's just going to be boring? And you're going to have to sit there and it's like, oh my gosh, this is awful. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. Yeah. So if you have a bad teacher, you're, you're definitely not going to like whatever they're saying. Like, it's like, this is boring. Why, mm -hmm. would, I, why would I even try? Because I don't care. But... If you have a good teacher, an interactive teacher, or someone who cares about you, cares about the material, and is able to communicate it, it makes a world of a difference. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Do you think having that awareness is what helps you teaching within an ESOL classroom to have that cultural awareness is what helps you modify yes. the information to be able to communicate it? Absolutely. And, um, yeah, I did this the other day. Um, I showed a movie, uh, Stand and Deliver. It's one of my favorite movies. But it speaks to the Mexican-American uh, experience. It, it, so basically what the movie is, is it's a guy. Um, he's, he's an immigrant from Bolivia. He's a math teacher. And he goes into this very like Latino-populated school, very heavily Latino-populated, and he's teaching them math. In the beginning of the movie, they don't even know algebra. By the end, they're passing an AP calculus exam. Mm. And this is a true story. But that experience, like, showing those kids that movie, like, that is their reality. Like, in the classroom, we hear Spanish and English all the time. Mm -hmm. In that movie, they're speaking Spanish and English all the time. Um, a lot of ESL teachers do it wrong because they don't know their population. They're just like, oh, whatever, we got to learn. We're going to learn about Cindy Lou Who and whatever, blah, 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 blah. But if I have a population of Latinos, I'm going to tell them about, like, the things we're going to read about, we read about Bad Bunny, we read about Maluma, we read about Regotoneros, like, we read about people that would interest them. I, I kind of trick them into learning, to be honest. <laughs> I'll print out an article, like, a liter like liter something that we can read and analyze mm -hmm. that is interesting to them, or that some something that means something to them or we'll watch a movie that is relatable to their experience mm -hmm. and you are so much more engaged in something if the person looks like you if you live that same experience if it's something that is similar to you and a lot of the times it's uh, it's, it's um pop culture icons uh, or, or people that these kids can look up to and be like hey that's me mm. you know um, but yeah, so that's another reason why I went into teaching is because who do these kids have to look up to mm. and they have nobody. So I'm going to be that somebody. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I agree. I, I would agree with that. Uh, something that I've been trying to, and we've mentioned this before, but something that I'm trying to be more aware with is, is what I'm consuming on a daily basis. Music being a big one because I really enjoy music. Same. I love, I love music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been paying a little more attention to the lyrics of mm -hmm. songs that I'm listening to and the impact that they have and the influence. 
So having spoken about your experiences, you know, why you've started as an ESLO, why did you why did you pursue Spanish and then taking a career as an ESLO teacher? Where do you see yourself within the next five years? And I know that's such that's a question that's made often, and I'm sure yeah, as a person you may make you may uh, ask yourself that. Yeah. Uh, but it's more so like where where could you see yourself? Yeah. Um. Really? Okay. So, part of the deal from going to part of the deal of going to College of Charleston and getting the full ride scholarship that I did was uh, the deal is. I was a teaching fellow, so you work a year, or sorry, you go to school a year, and then you pay that off by working a year. So, went to school for four years, I have four years of teaching in the South Carolina public education system that is required, unless I want to take that, that on monetarily. So I'm giving back my time instead of, I'm giving back time instead of money, essentially. So, goal right now is... I, I finished I finished one year I finished I'm in my second year right now uh, I have two more years after this uh, I like where I'm at right now I like the high school the goal is uh, just uh, right now I'm working on a master's finish that I really want to take I really want to travel with this job I would I don't really want to stay, stay in South Carolina I would love to go to a different country and pursue a master's. Um, one, because it's cheaper. Two, because I'm in a different country, I get to speak Spanish, ha ha ha. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Guatemala this summer, uh, right? And while I was there, I did a certification in ESOL. And it's a private company, it's called Maximo Nivelle, and they have private English, a private English school there. So I could definitely see myself teaching at a private English school somewhere in Guatemala, Mexico, and Colombia, wherever. Um, maybe even in Europe, I don't know, but that's kind of, that's the next step. Mm -hmm. I want to get my master's done, get it out the way, maybe get another one. I'd love to get one in applied linguistics, um, or linguistics in general, that'd be great. Um, and then teach, teach English to people who want to learn English. I don't want to worry about behavior, I want to teach. Mm. Uh, and I want to, I, I love linguistics, I want to teach linguistics. Um, I want to get into the grammar, like the nitty gritty, you know, mm. you can't do that with kids. Um, but eventually I would like to get a doctorate in linguistics. Um, eventually get my master's in applied linguistics, find a university where I can get a doctorate and then, um, you know, teach at the university level, because mm. that is the that's the ultimate. Being a teacher, that's the that's that that's whew, that's up there. That's mm -hmm. the professional. Like that's the pro league. If you're a teacher, mm -hmm. being teaching in a university, the pro league. Yeah, the pros. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was gonna make an acronym, but I cannot. I'm not that witty right now. <laughs> um, I do have a question, uh, and I haven't presented this question to you before, so I'd like to get an authentic answer okay. if you're open to it. Sure. What would you say the Latin American culture has done for you, for lack of better words? Um, this is, yeah, that's an interesting question. So, this is really weird, but it's given me an identity. Mm. So, uh, me growing up in being an American, I don't like football. I don't care about sweet tea. I don't care about all the regular American <laughs> things. I don't care. Like, I just, I, I mean, like, I dress differently. I don't wear Lululemon or whatever the heck, or I don't, I don't dress, like, I'm interested in languages and cultures and stuff. Mm -hmm. And what the, for the lack of a better term, like, it, it's kind of like, oh, I'm, I'm not white guy that speaks Spanish. Like, that's cool. Like, it's given me an identity, like, whereas, like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to explain it. Um, whereas I'm kind of, like, reject, I don't know, not rejected by American, like, the white culture or the, the European culture. It's like, I don't really fit in with that. So I fit in a lot more with, with, Latin American culture and Latin culture and being able to speak the language and the music and everything, uh, eat the food, like, 
it's given me something, you know, and I'm still like, I'm, I'm not saying I want to be Latino. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of who I am and where I've come from, but it's something that's just like a different dimension for me that I know about, you know, um, I don't know. That's hard. That's such a difficult question, but it's, it, it's definitely, it's also given me an area where I can, where I can help being a translator, being someone who goes in between. Like, if my kids or my, my kids, parents of my kids have a problem, they come to me and I can help, because I'm the mediator. I'm the guy that can go in between, back and forth, because I know both cultures very well. So I guess that's kind of what it, it's given for me, is uh, it's given me some sort of an identity, like as the person that can go between, I guess. Which, I don't know, that, that, that's such a difficult, what has it done for me? I don't know. Given, definitely expanded my horizons a lot. Mm. Love the, I love, I love the food, love the culture. <laughs> I love the music, oh my god, I love, I love the music. Mm -hmm. Music in Spanish, oof. I think I resonate more with music. I also, I just love, I'm listening to music all the time. Mm -hmm. I think I resonate with music in Spanish more than I do in English. I don't know why. I do not know why. Mm -hmm. But it's given me... Uh, given me that. Yeah. I don't know. That, that's an interesting question. I, I know. It's it's a lot. Tough. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's so much to unpack, especially not in 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, my, my... The culture for me has... It, I appreciate and admire the passion that you share for it. Mm -hmm. And I would say that I share the same sentiment for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. But I understand that the identity portion, the responsibility portion that comes with having access to it as well, right? What it means to be a uh, first generation Guatemalan American 24 year old woman in the United States of America. What does that mean? You yeah. know, and it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to unpack. It's a lot to talk about the responsibility that you can take on with that identity mm -hmm. um, is, is, is beautiful. But then the culture is so amazing. And I agree. so just I agree. it's beautiful. And of course, there are certain things that I personally, you know, do not agree with machismo being one of them. Uh, but it's something that I think you learn as you go, how to navigate um, your interpretation of the culture. My, by your, I'm saying myself, my mm -hmm. interpretation of the culture is different, you Agreed, know, yeah. and and being Guatemalan American, that inter that intersectionality is also comes with its challenges, right? And we spoke about this a bit before, but being American and also having Guatemalan blood run through my veins, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, having access to Spanish, and I, I I would be careful personally with saying that I am fluent. Uh, I've studied it throughout university and I studied it in high school but it hasn't it's not where it needs to be for mm -hmm. my own standards I think I've lost it quite a bit uh, but that's something I need to work on um, but the responsibility that it holds to know a different language with such a large population of yes. Latinos there's it's, it's it's beautiful I take a lot of pride in the responsibility myself um, in terms of having the resources that I've had, being able to build what I've built on my own yeah. and figuring out how to give that back. And you do that on a daily basis. And I really, really admire, appreciate, and I, I cannot speak on behalf of my community, but as a 24-year-old Guatemalan-American woman in the United States, I'm very grateful for individuals like yourself mm -hmm. and yourself because it helps us and it helps the community and it's tough to be a five-year-old translating documents so to know that individuals like yourself exist and are out there and have that desire to help and are aware enough that there is an area of opportunity there is so powerful mm -hmm. and so beautiful so i don't you mentioned this uh teachers aren't thanked enough but you as an individual tim gasparic it's a thank you to you, you. for, yeah, for no, your perspective. I, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you.
Te lo agradezco mucho. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, um, yeah. No, I don't think anybody has ever thanked me for that, actually, now that I think about it. And, yeah, I appreciate it. I, I see a lot of the times, like, people don't want to help. Mm -hmm. A lot of my kids, for example, they speak Spanish and English. Um, they see the kid that only speaks Spanish and they just let him crash and burn. Like they're like, that's not my responsibility to help him. Mm. It's not my responsibility. I don't have to help him. I don't have to translate for him. Mm -hmm. I think it is. If you speak two languages, it's your responsibility to help and to try. At least mm -hmm. try. Like you don't have to know calculus and translate calculus, Spanish and English for somebody. But if you if you can manage if you can navigate two different languages, two different cultures, I think it's part of your responsibility as a as a person um, to help the other people help other people who are trying. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of culture clash in the ESOL classroom because the kids that speak Spanish and English. Um, second, third generation kids don't really like the first generation immigrants who mm -hmm. only speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. And that always confused me. Mm. Always confused me. Now there are some, there are some who go in between and I'm like, that's me right there. Mm -hmm. Like there are some kids who will speak Spanish with the kids that only speak Spanish and then speak English with the kids that are bilingual and mm. they'll go in between, they don't see any difference. Mm. But then there's other kids and I had this conversation recently, they're like, I, I, it's kind of like like a little a little bit of pride on mm. their part in, in them being like I'm American like I'm better than them like yeah like blah and I'm like like I'm like you're in the you're in the ESL classroom too mm. you're here and those kids are here so what makes you better than them like no if anything you have more responsibility and you should be helping other kids mm. so and and there's yeah I don't know there's a lot of conflict but um, there are some kids that that know. Uh, how to go back and forth and mm -hmm. help and help, yeah. And mm -hmm. I love those kids. Yeah, it's it's oh, it's it's an identity. It's an to be on the other side of right Guatemalan American. It's an identity thing that requires awareness mm -hmm. yeah. to be able to say, "Wow, I've been given this opportunity and this blessing to be able to have a type of security in this country." But to be able to use those resources to then uplift those around mm -hmm. you is so important. Yeah. And um, obviously being aware, right? You can't pour out of an empty cup either. So ensuring that you are okay as a person. But if you can, to go and help. Um, I, I say this often, but if my parents wouldn't have came, I don't, where would I be? Where would what would my have what would my experience have been? Where would I have been at the age of twenty four? You know, we were talking about what ifs, and that's a what if. Yeah, and if those people that, if those people that helped your parents didn't help their help yeah. them, where would you be? Mm -hmm. Someone had to help them, and someone mm -hmm. had to help them manage the two different cultures before they could do it mm -hmm. on their own and show them the ropes and stuff. So, I don't know. Be that person to help. Mm -hmm. If you can speak two languages, like. And it, I was talking to my friend about this. It's any any person who's bilingual has that identity crisis where it's like, like which one am I? Mm -hmm. Like which one do I more adhere to? It's like no, you can, you can you can ride the line, do both. Mm -hmm. um, and that is what's so difficult about being, like, like a, a Guatemalan American. Mm -hmm. It's because you are. You're not quite fully Guatemalan, and you're not quite fully American. You're some somewhere in between, and and that's so like, I always say like I always feel like I've never fit into a box, mm -hmm. but being bilingual, being able to help people has that's kind of the box that I fill in and mm -hmm. check out. Mm -hmm. So, but it's tough because you don't fit in quite over here, and you don't fit in quite right over here. Mm -hmm. So it's like whoa, whoa, like what do I do? What do I mm -hmm. do? Whoa, like. Yeah, I don't know, that's tough. But um, it's something where you just have to be strong enough and be like, I am me, this is my identity, and I'm gonna rock it. Like, mm -hmm. a, this is this is who I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's hard. But that's so hard. And it's taken me a long time to figure out what that is. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 
I hundred percent. I hundred percent agree. It's it's, it's tough. to navigate it is complex. Yeah. Um. To to finish off this episode, I I do have a question. What what advice would you give to someone that is trying to figure out what they're going to do with their life? Yeah. Um. That's a good question. It's tough too because, uh, you could say, well, start with what you like. A lot of people don't know what they like. Like they don't know. I don't know what I want to do. Like I don't know what I'm good at. Like, like we said, there's so many different opportunities. Like what do I know? Like what am I good at? So start with what you don't like. Start. Um, all right. In, in high school, I didn't like biology. I know I won't be a scientist, but I sure like. I, Sure did like, uh, I don't know, math, whatever. Mm-hmm. Start, it, it helps, it helps when we have so many, like an infinite set of possibilities. It helps by starting off what you don't like because it kind of narrows your perspective a little bit. Okay, I'm good at this, I'm not good at that. All right, kind of, you're kind of like chiseling away. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd say that, start with what you like, what you don't like, figure that out. But another thing is where are you most... Uh, where do your where where does what you like and where you can be useful line up so for me um i like speaking spanish i love the culture and i like being a teacher so it's pretty simple for me Mm -hmm. um i can be a english and spanish teacher right um mine was easy i had i had the privilege of knowing what i wanted to do but just kind of start asking yourself um, another thing is, I think it takes a lot of reflection. What am I good at? What am I bad at? What would I like to do for free? That's another thing. I would teach for free if I could, because I love it. I love it. What is something that you would do for free on and off, on and off? Like, that's another, um, I don't know, little mind, mind ex- like a little experiment you can play. Like, what is something that I would do for free? If no one paid me, I'd still show up and do it. Cause that's what your passion is mm. so if your passion lines up with something that can make you money heck yes do that do that sometimes like there are some some passions you may have that won't will are i guess won't bring the money in um i guess it's a silly example but it's like basket weaving man i love weaving baskets um i love making an art, making a craft. Our society, sadly, doesn't value art that much. Mm -hmm. So you could say, man, I would paint all day, every day if I could. Um, And yeah, you could, but you won't be, you won't be able to provide for yourself. So uh, another thing my dad told me, he's like, if you're going to college, major in what will make you money and minor in what will make you, what what you love. So I majored in education because it could make me, could give me a job education in Spanish and I'm minor in linguistics because there's not really that many jobs for linguists out there. Um, can't really go around and document languages. Like you don't give any money for that. No one's mm-hmm. really sending money for that. So I found somewhere where I could fit my linguistics ability into a job and that linguistics is uh, education. So if you want to be an artist, find where you can fit your art into somewhere that can make you money. Mm. So yeah, if you want to be a basket weaver, um, I don't know. <laughs> or if you want to sell paintings, <laughs> I, um, you could be an art teacher or you could, you could, um, you know, sell your craft in some way. I don't know. That is a, that is such a difficult question because it's so individually, it's based on who you are. Mm-hmm. I can give you the tools to kind of figure it out, but you just have to figure it out for yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's what I'd say to that. I like that. I like that it's answer. Yeah. I like it. It, it is. And it, it's everyone's experience and, and everyone's journey. And, and sometimes you find your passion later on in life. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you find it super early and super young. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was blessed. Mm-hmm. I, okay. One thing is like Jimi Hendrix didn't even pick up a guitar till it was like 20, 21, 22. Or something like there's some people who find their page like their passion later on down the road. Mm-hmm. So just because you don't have it now doesn't mean you have you won't have, find it later. Yeah. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Embracing your journey, embracing where you're at in life. Um, short story. My sister went to school to be a doctor. 
because her parent, my, my parents were pushing her to be a doctor. They were also pushing me to be a doctor. I did not want to do that. So she did what other people wanted to do. That was not, that was not her passion. Mm. So if you try, if you, if you try to do what other people want for you, it will break you. She had a total, she had a terrible time in college because she's doing what everybody else wants mm. them to do, mm. her to do. Mm -hmm. So it, it's going to hurt you a lot more if you do what other people want for you than to do what you want to do for you. Mm. And it, it is kind of selfish sometimes, or you can seem kind of selfish, but at the end of the day, it's your life. So you have to make the decisions for you. Um, and, I, you know, obviously, I'm not saying don't listen to your parents because that's you need to do that because they know better. But if, um, if you know that it won't make you happy or if it won't fulfill you, then I would not go down that road. Mm. So, yeah. I like that. I mm -hmm. appreciate that. The, the ability to choose what you love, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> To be able to step away from something that doesn't fulfill you or doesn't make you happy anymore. To pivot is a challenge because I think in a way it could be interpreted to yourself. That's how I see it as failure. Mm -hmm. You failed at one thing. Now you have to retry at something yeah, else. But reality, it's an opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. To discover something else about yourself and, and navigate something new. You learn more about yourself and the subject that you're studying. But I appreciate it. Yep. I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate the energy shared today. I appreciate your time. Extremely grateful. This is Tim Gasparic, season two, episode five. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, we're at five minutes. So we'll have to close it. Okay, up. okay. Oh man, I had something to say, but I completely forgot. Um, a word of advice, a word of warning. I don't remember. Oh no, so yes, I could, okay, sorry. Um, short story, my sister went to school to be a doctor because